Our final speaker this afternoon is uh, Ryan Woodland, who, working in Shrub Step, has no doubt to put up with uh, a large number of encroachment jokes. Uh, um, he's going to be speaking with us today, though, on using uh, grazing and sagebrush step restoration. Um, Ryan is uh, an alumnus and, and a current student at uh, Utah State University, uh, working here in uh, Rangeland Science in the department with Dr. Neil West and Fred Provenza. Uh, Ryan lives in Blackfoot, Idaho, with his wife and children, and he works for the Idaho Department of Lands, which manages Idaho's um, endowment lands, is a senior resource specialist in the range program. Ryan. Well, I'm, uh, I appreciate everybody sticking around for this last talk. I know you're all pretty excited at 4.30 in the afternoon, and uh, I'll try to make it worth your while. Uh, I'm also equally as excited to see a lot of you that I knew in school and have known since I've been out of school that I know work directly uh, with land management agencies or, or producers. And I, I hope that as you, uh, as you hear this talk, you'll, you'll think about things that could be applicable to your situation um, and, and, and take it from there. Uh, as it was said, you know, I, I, changed, I changed the name of my talk several times, uh, and I, but I finally settled on this one here because that's, that most uh, closely reflects how I, how I view what we did. Uh, just to review a little bit, I know you've, you've probably heard this, so I won't spend much time on it. The map we're looking at here is, is one of Kukler's map, uh, maps that, that talks about and delineates the sagebrush step vegetation type and although uh, its, its range has shrunk a bunch, uh, it's still one of the largest vegetation types in the western U.S., uh, covering somewhere between 50 and 60 million hectares. And I, I want you to keep in mind as I go through this talk that you know, the strict definition of, of sagebrush step is, uh, is a co-dominance with shrubs and grasses. It's not a grassland, it's not a shrubland. And so just something to bear in mind as, as, I, as I move forward here. Uh, again, things that you already know, so I won't spend much time. The sagebrush uh, as a plant itself uh, is, is very unique and has some characteristics that allow it to, uh, to be very competitive and thrive in an environment that's often quite competitive itself and limited in resources. And if left unchecked, these plants, uh, the potentially we have the opportunity to find the uh, very old, uh, dense, even age stands of brush with very little or no production uh, in the understory. And in addition, sometimes when those plants get to that point, the sagebrush itself is not very productive, very decadent, and uh, where a lot of those resources are tied up in the, in the woody tissues. Uh, historically, there were several disturbances that kept these systems in check. Uh, as man entered the scene, uh, you can see these disturbances took on a little bit of a different face, and each one uh, has its own pros and cons uh, as, as compared to the, the project we did. Um, you look at uh, the mechanical treatments uh, considered are, are rising energy costs in the society today. Uh, chemicals, uh, there's always a, a you know, potential for negative public perception there, even though they can be very effective and very controlled. Uh, fires, again, a, a great opportunity there, but you can see from, from, from this summer uh, what can happen with, if those fires are, are too widespread. In fact, we, we pulled off a controlled burn uh, in cooperation with the BLM up near St. Anthony in Kilgore, Idaho, uh, that we would not have been able to do on our own because as an endowment land management agency, we have to financially uh, analyze everything we do and it has to show a benefit, benefit to the endowments. And if we were to do that on our own, uh, we, couldn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it work out because we couldn't make it pay, but with the BLM. And so those costs are also associated with that. And cattle grazing, whether uh, it's intended or not, uh, cattle grazing does uh, steer the vegetation one way or another. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, it uh, favors uh, shrubs. And like I say, whether you like, uh, like cattle grazing or you don't like it, uh, it is a management tool that's used today. Uh, we wanted to introduce another uh, a bio agent, if you will, a biological agent in these systems, and we felt in this case a sheep best fit that bill. Uh, the study had four objectives, and uh, we felt that we could meet these objectives by reducing uh, the abundance of Wyoming big sagebrush. The first one of those was to increase uh, the plant species richness, the number of species in those plots, biodiversity some might call it. The other was to alter the age class distribution of the Wyoming big sage. We, uh, we don't want to find just the old, uh, we want to have a more even distribution and I'll, 
I'll show a slide a little bit later on that talks about some more of those benefits. Uh, we also wanted to increase uh, basically forage production, the herbaceous perennial understory. Uh, some people, uh, I've heard mentioned today that uh, a lot of projects were, were geared and done with the intent of increasing forage production. Uh, that is not necessarily a bad thing, as long as it's not our only intent, but this uh, you know, can benefit wildlife as well. We also wanted to examine the uh, indications initially in the way of the resilience of the plants. We didn't want to graze the sagebrush or the grass so hard that we killed it out. It wasn't our intent. Uh, to do this, we applied our two treatments. Basically, we had uh, our controls, which were no grazing, and then our fall supplemented sheep grazing. Uh, fall was chosen for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the herbaceous plants by this time have gone through their peak growing season and are basically dormant, and so we we uh, run much less of a risk of harming them irreparably. Uh, also, the, uh, the terpenes and the other metabolites, secondary chemicals in sagebrush, which can potentially limit their intake by especially native uh, herbivores, those concentrations tend to taper off towards fall. So by doing it in the fall, we, we felt we had a good opportunity to utilize as much sagebrush as possible without harming the herbaceous plants. Uh, the supplement uh, put these sheep basically on a, on a plan of nutrition that helps them to metabolize those chemicals. We didn't want to cause them harm either. Uh, the experiment itself, excuse me, was conducted on desert land livestock. A lot of you are probably familiar with that in northern Utah, not too far from here. And just to give you a, a little bit of reference uh, back to give that distribution map, we're probably just at the southern fringe of uh, the sagebrush step uh, distribution. I don't want to get into a lot of details of our study. Uh, I want to get to basically what, what we saw. But we, we grazed 40 dry ewes on these three plots that you can see uh, there and two up here at the top uh, for about 10 days and this was the equivalent of 67 head an acre or about 670 sheep days uh, per acre. The supplement itself was a custom mix of those things there. We had beet pulp, corn, soybean meal and alfalfa and each of those ewes received just under two pounds uh, a piece per day. We had three samplings right before the sheep went in, right after they came out, and then again one year following that grazing to see what kind of response we had. Uh, what we looked at, we sampled everything above the ground. Uh, we looked at the shrubs, the herbs, uh, both living and dead, uh, the litter, the standing dead, as well as uh, the species richness. Again, you know, how many, how many numbers of species were in each of those treatments at the, each sample period, as well as how much of them, th their production on a gram per square meter basis. We also looked at the age classes of Wyoming Big Sage and based this basically off of previous research done by uh, Gatsuck et al. I don't know if I say his name right or not. Uh, basically ranging in one from eight on the scale, one being the very youngest with just cotyledons and all the way up to eight with uh, you know just about dead. Not much production, a lot of woody tissue, and of course we have everything in between there. Uh, after the sheep left, we calculated, well I shouldn't say we, I calculated, <laughs> that uh, the sheep used just about everything that we considered available for it. And that was, uh, that was current annual growth on the sagebrush, current annual growth on the other shrubs, which was uh, rabbit brush, horse brush, winter fat, uh, and low sagebrush. Uh, they used almost all of that, and they used all of the uh, current annual growth of the other shrubs, excuse me, uh, the live grasses, 100% of the live forbs, almost all of the herbaceous standing dead and then just under half of the herbaceous litter which the majority of that and looking at it was mostly sagebrush leaves so by the time they got to that point they uh, they'd had enough sagebrush and, and didn't care to dig through the dirt for any more. Uh, just to give you an idea of what things looked like at that level of utilization because it's really hard to get your mind around unless you see it. This is a plot before the sheep went in uh, and right after they came out. And you can see, you know, whether it was through their grazing or their movements through the plot, not much of that ground didn't get impacted to some level. Again, just in the foreground here, this was a grazed plot after the sheep left. This was a control plot that didn't see any sheep grazing. Uh, a close-up of one of the sagebrush plants, you can see that they really put the herd on those plants. And uh, even to the point where some of the woody tissue was eaten as well. They weren't happy about it either, I'll tell you that. Um, now, also remember uh, what I said earlier about that we want to accomplish those objectives by reducing Wyoming Big Sage and its production on a gram per square meter basis. And we were pretty successful here. 
in the graze plots a year after, there was 66% less production in those graze plots. Now, i got to qualify this and, and go off on a little bit of a tangent. We saw also a 27% reduction in the control plots, which that's not supposed to happen. Your control plots are supposed to stay perfect and the weather doesn't change and everything is good. But what happened was over that winter, as near as we can tell, this is what happened. There was an onset of snow mold, a fungal attack. And uh, you went, we went back the next spring and when I sampled the control plots, those plants just had a very sickly appearance, you know, uh, gray, dead looking. And so we attribute most of that reduction there to that, to that snow mold. And this could have an explanation for a few of the next slides, so that's why I have to throw that in there. Uh, plant species richness. Uh, in the control plots, you can see here from here, it's, uh, we had a 75% increase from pre-grazing to the year later in the control plots, which again, that wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. Uh, and you can see here, in the, in the graze plots, we have a 61% increase. And overall, the, the graze plots had more, more, more numbers of species. Now, I usually get a question, and so I'll address it right now. Somebody's going to say, well, yeah, if you graze it that hard, you're going to have more species, and they're going to be cheap grass and thistles and mustard and all kinds of noxious weeds. And so we looked at this as well. And, and you know, when you talk about desirable versus undesirable, that's a pretty subjective thing. What's desirable to me may not be desirable, desirable to you. You just say the word crested wheatgrass and you can probably split a room pretty evenly or, or not so evenly. Okay, before the sheep went in, the controls had basically four desirable plants for every one undesirable plant. And the graze plots had a less of that. It was a two to one ratio. A year after that, uh, the control plots basically that they dropped to three desirable plants for every one undesirable plant, while the graze plots stayed pretty much the same. Now, th this would suggest maybe that while it didn't increase or decrease as far as the grazing treatment goes, it stayed the same, and so maybe we we didn't hurt it as far as desirable plants go, and didn't invite an opportunity for undesirable plants. And I should say also, uh, our site didn't have a lot of undesirable plants. Um, we didn't have an abundance of cheap grass. We had a very good understory to begin with, and so you have to keep in mind it's a case-by-case -case basis of what you can apply. Looking at the ACE class distribution, you can see here this is at the pre-graze uh, treatment. Both the controls and the graze, they're pretty much the same, which was good. We expected them to be, and we're glad to see that with a lot of the, the, the middle ACE classes showing a big, a big spike. Looking at just the control plots, you can see here a year after in the blue and the gray is the pre-graze that there's a little more of an even distribution uh, moving towards the older age classes. Still no change in the recruitment of the younger age classes. We look at the graze plots. Uh, there's definitely more of an even distribution than there was at the, at the first uh, sampling. And you can see here, there's more recruitment at the younger age classes, which is encouraging to us. Uh, you compare the two a year after the sheep had left, and you can see there that the graze plots is a little more even in this distribution. And again, you notice that recruitment in the younger age classes. Uh, looking at the biomass of just the grasses, uh, we can see here that the control plots had a higher relative increase of 55%. The graze plots only increased 43%, but overall they had a higher uh, grass production there, about 64% higher. Uh, looking at the forbs, it's uh, just about reversed that the control plots had a higher overall production as far as forb goes, only increased 24%, where uh, the graze plots increased 60%, but overall, again, those control plots were 38% higher in their forb production. When you combine those two together with the grasses and the forbs, we'll just call them herbs, uh, you can see here that uh, those increased relative to the pre-graze of various uh, degrees, uh, and the control plots were 5% higher in its overall herb production. And this might beg the question, wait, we ought to just leave things alone. Uh, and if, if it is indeed that snow mold that we contribute that to, it's, uh, it's a little faulty thinking because it's, we, don't, we can't control those things. We don't know when they're going to hit and what, to what level. And so we've got to just remember, this is what we actually applied and what we had some control over. Just to recap, uh, here in the control plots, we reduced current annual growth of Wyoming Big Sage by 27%, increased those herbs by 31 Here in the graze plots, we reduced by 66% and increased those herbs by 
Now, when we looked at the resilience, uh, you got, I would like you to remember here that this is the sagebrush. And it basically had to start from ground zero after those sheep left here in the red. And we might say that it was reduced by 66%, but we also want to remember that it rebounded 34%. Because again, it wasn't our intent to kill it. We look at all of the other uh, categories in the graze plots, and uh, you can see in the gray here, those are pre-graze levels. And they not only came back to where they were before, but they exceeded that by those varying degrees. Again, just a little bit of an idea of, of what these things looked like when the sheep left. A year later, this is what they looked like. And you can see there's definite value there for cattle, uh, wildlife as well. Now this, these next couple slides, I think, are, are, are quite telling of what went on. Once you look right here, I'll put a square around it on the computer as well. That part of the plot was set to be grazed in 2003, and it was. You can see that it's pretty well uniform with the rest of it. Not much difference that I can see just from my eye. Uh, the next year, or excuse me, after the sheep left, you can see the impact there. That was from a helicopter. In case you're not sure where it is, that was what was grazed. Uh, in the spring of 05, you're looking right here. That's what it looked like. I'll put a square around that. In the fall of 06, again right here, you can see it, it maintains that open character. And this picture was taken uh, just about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago when we were over Deseret on a tour with, uh, with a group of cattle producers. And I couldn't put a square on it in the time I had, but there it is right there. You can see it still maintain that. If you can kind of in your mind's eye, look at that and extrapolate that to the area around it. Uh, the, the sagebrush is still there, but the grass and the forbs have also come in quite well. Now, in, in addition to, this is a slide you've probably seen in some other talks, I stole it from Rick Danver. Oh, I keep bumping that button. That's what it does. Uh, I, I, Rick is actually, this is his slide. But in addition to the opportunity to, to promote the younger sagebrush plants, we can see that there are animals, right now sage grouse are a pretty hot topic, but there are other animals that benefit from the different structures and the height of those skeletons that are left behind after the grazing treatments were applied. Whereas some of the other treatments, uh, they may not be there if there's a mechanical treatment, a burn, whatever. Uh, chemicals, of course, do leave those skeleton, skeletons behind as well. Uh, in my mind, one of the newest things that's come about since, since this project has been finished uh, Roger Banner, along with the Utah State Extension, have taken these concepts and, and are applying them on a larger scale. They've got two projects going on right now. One is down in Parker Mountain, and uh, applying it, you can see here the number is 64 acres, about 1,000 head of sheep rather than my little 40 head per plot. Uh, their grazing season was, was very similar to mine, just a little bit later, uh, 10 days in the pasture, and their sheep days are quite similar. And I. He gave me some details and I lost them on my computer and so I don't have all the results that I'd like to tell you. But he, he was quite excited about what they saw down there. You see what the rancher said here, best lambing in years, high percent of twins. Even after the project was done, he stayed there and continued to graze the, that sagebrush. Uh, the other one is down on Blue Mountain, uh, just a few less acres here, a few more sheep a little later in the year, which actually is, can be quite good because it can help reduce your cost. If, if you're grazing these plants at a time when they're all covered up with snow, you don't have to haul water. Uh, your herder's up there with them anyway, so that's already a cost that's factored in. Uh, you don't have to haul water, and those plants that could be harmed are covered up with snow. You're grazing nothing but the, but the brush. Uh, the sheep days were a little heavier. The rancher did notice the lambs came in in a little poor condition because of bad weather, and so they were a little stressed, but they went on to lamb and bread just, just like normal and uh, continue to graze those foothills even after the project is over. Another comment he put in that I didn't include but I'll tell you about, uh, and this is a little bit on the behavior of the things, but this is, a, this is a part of the range that this rancher has used for years, and he said typically uh, towards fall at a certain time these ewes, they knew it was time to head to the desert. Whether they've been trained by the sheep herders to go there or they trained the sheep herders to take them there, whichever, I don't know. But so there's a large part of this ground that gone unused. Well, these ewe lambs didn't know any better. And at this point, they become quite settled. They were with the routine, the supplement, and the brush. And they used ground that he claimed hadn't been grazed uh, previously in 10 years. So there's another benefit to it. One of the plants that uh, had been grazed in that trial, 
uh, just draw a few conclusions. I made a few notes. Let me make sure I'm not skipping anything here. All right, I think I'm in good shape. Um, but a few conclusions. There were, there were problems like there are any research. We can't control the weather. We can't control everything that goes on. But we know in our case, uh, where we did it, and like I say, you can't apply this to every piece of dirt on the earth, but we know that we reduced Wyoming big sagebrush, and we know that the herbs, uh, the forbs and the grasses increased. We know that the species diversity increased as well. So take that for what it's worth. It was our intent to put another tool in the manager's toolbox and give him options, and hopefully that's something that, that we've done. Uh, for any management option to be sustainable, uh, it's been said, and I agree, that it's got to meet those, those three criteria. Uh, we addressed many of the ecology of it, and at least in our case, in this short little time frame that we've, we've looked at it, 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 should, it looks like it's going to be. Uh, of course, the, the real story will come five years from now, ten years from now, what it looks like, what the response is, and, and that's being monitored, and, and I hope it continues to be so. Uh, I'll let uh, Mark Brunson and his bunch look at the social acceptability of it. That's, uh, we didn't look at that at all. The economics of it, you know, that wasn't part of my project, but we do know a little bit on the cost of the supplement. Uh, you know, it's, it's got some advantages economically. Uh, I was told, and so I'm, I don't work for a federal agency, so if you do and I'm wrong, you can shout at me and tell me I'm wrong. But I was told that if, if sheep are used in this case on, on federal ground, they don't have to do an ARC study. And there's also some other implications as far as reducing the cost of, of the NEPA process. So that, that drops your costs uh, a bunch. And like I say, if I'm wrong, I know there's some forest service go back there, you just holler at me. But that, that's what I was told, and from what I understand, art studies are a huge cost in any kind of treatment. Uh, there's future research possibilities here. Again, the social aspects, the economics of it. Uh, snow mold, it's a great opportunity. We actually have pre-snow mold data, which I don't know is a very common thing. Uh, in, in our case, like I said, we had really good understory to work with, not a lot of bad plants that we consider undesirable. Uh, there's a possibility for someone to combine this with a, with a seeding treatment, uh, in possibly in, in sheet grass or another place where, where the understory is not quite as desirable. Uh, Roger and those guys did look some at animal, animal performance, but there's always room there. And, you know, to bump it up to landscape level, you know, you, you think about the, the scale we were on, we are in those small plots, they went up to 64 acres. Uh, it, scale is, is moving up slowly and there's always opportunity for those kinds of research. Uh, just to thank a few people, uh, Dr. West, uh, Fred Provenza, uh, the folks over at Deseret, everybody in the Behave Consortium that uh, actually funded this research, uh, Roger Banner. I didn't mention my wife, but she ought to think she's been pretty patient and, uh, and hasn't run off on me. So. <laughs> With that, I'm glad to take any questions. Am I okay on time? Okay. talk about that and that's why they're kind of monitoring this to see because obviously you can see there there hasn't been a sheep in there so of course that grass is going to be look really robust and full and whether it's going to be a five year rotation or a ten year rotation or something you do just as part of your grazing management you know that's some more research I hope that they're addressing right now and I think they read work in that way so I don't have a good answer for you I wish I did Right, and, and that's where the person would have to look at, at the site and their management objectives. I mean, you can overgraze sagebrush and kill it. You can overgraze, overgraze grass and the brush will grow. Uh, if you want to, if you want to grow. Uh, winter range, I would recommend this. I would recommend a lot of cattle on a little bit of grass and let that brush go. Long term effects, that, again, that's what, uh, that's what hopefully some more grad students down the road are watching and keeping an eye on. Uh, initially, you, you go there, you know, and I, my picture taking abilities are pretty poor, but you go to those plots and there's, there's some dead ones, obviously. There's the skeletons there. 
there's some young ones coming from recruitment, and there's some middle aged ones that had, and the ones that came back the next spring, the, the growth on them was just uh, amazing. Of course, that was a pretty, that could be a pretty short lived response. It's, it's hard to say definitely uh, without my glass ball with me. Brian, the principal factor there was the gradient pressure, forcing the animal to eat down, putting down the desire to be forcing them to stay fresh. Now, uh, Roger scaled that up to a 64 acre thing. Is it really practical to put that extremely heavy grading pressure on a larger scale on one grade, which is make it practical? You mean as far as uh, making run out of options before they, before they go to the shrubs? You know, I, I talked with Roger and I, again, I lost his fact sheet that he gave me. I, I, I'd be able to tell you more. It was my understanding they did kind of a training period on, on a smaller scale with those sheep uh, and got through that end of things, basically running out of alternatives and then turning to the shrubs. And then when they got to a larger scale, they, you hate to uh, extract what human thoughts to sheep, but it was kind of, well, we know this is part of the deal. We're not going to wait so long this time. We'll like, supplement a little bit of grass, the brush, all together. And I, that was my understanding that they did a training period before they moved up to the larger scale. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, but you're still going to have to have that grading grade. You can put that on a larger grade because that's kind of question. Yeah, and you have to look at the site potential. Uh, what, what, what can it do at all? I mean, if it's not going to gr come back anything desirable, I'd be pretty careful. You know, your precipitation, that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and your objectives. Again, I'll, I'll, I would always consider those uh, a case by case basis. I, I would exercise caution. It worked well in this case. And it worked well in Hodges' case, but uh, person has to be pretty careful. On the part of the mountain, this coming winter, they're going to take those sheep and take them out of the tent plots and put them into a more natural setting where the herd will move to for several selected sites. It fills up, and then, but the feeling gets them out that the sheep are trained and they know that they can't eat the brush, and the herd knows how to manage the feeding the brush. They're going to try it in a more real life setting to see how that how that will work. And Michael, we've got to be still going to work with that. Good. Well, you, you obviously know more than that. that. That's good. And I guess, Mike, back to the question, I would, I would also add, you know, a, a person would have to look at, at the frequency they're going to do this. If the person does this one year in 20, I wouldn't be too concerned. But if they're going to plan on doing it every five years and, and applying that kind of pressure, again, it would be pretty cautious. Yeah, um, just a comment. This, this right here is very interesting. It kind of ties in with one of our cards paper on licensing and raising systems out here. Yep. Now, his whole hypothesis about the very intense grazing pressure for very short duration on the landscape scale. Uh, he was, uh, I read that paper. <laughs> All right. Well, appreciate your questions and your interest.